guys. Welcome to the Capital Mindset Show. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. And Fabio, what are we looking at here today? Well, today we're going to go over with our audience something called the discounted cash flow model, right? And there's a couple things that are important about the discounted cash flow model that we're going to hope to teach to our audience for free as to why they should probably think about implementing it in their investing routine. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, Fabio, you kind of already defined this, but what is a discounted cash flow model? So a discounted cash flow model is basically grabbing the value of the cash flow as a business or an asset will produce into the future and then bringing it back to today's value, right? Because at the end of the day, what is the value of an asset? Well, the value of an asset is what the uh, asset will produce into the future. However, you should really think about this. What is more valuable, a dollar today or a dollar tomorrow? And the answer is always a dollar today. Mm -hmm. So dollars produced in the future are less valuable than they are today. And a lot of people, I see that they don't really do a good job of explaining as to why you do a discounted cash flow model. Well, because of something called uh, opportunity cost as well. So you have to also compare what are your alternatives to put your capital to work, right? So in, in the investment world, we have a ton of different alternatives. And we have stuff like treasury bills, right? So the safest asset in existence. And then we have other things like uh, the S&P 500 index fund, the VT index fund, all these other different kinds of products. So when we think about an, invest, an investment, we have to compare that to, well, what else could I be putting this money into, right? And that's part of the discounted cash flow model. Then again, you must consider a couple other things about a business, such as, are they diluting shares? Are they buying back shares? Then you might want to consider inflation on a higher level because that could be that the, the, dollar, the dollar is literally losing value in the future. And the inflation could be varying amounts, but that would require kind of a high level understanding of macroeconomics. So really, you don't really need too much about that. You can think about it in nominal terms, right? So we can kind of get into uh, an example with our model as to a discounted cash flow model. And Austin, you let me know. So actually, Fabio, before we get into that, I kind of have a question. So you were university trained on how to make a discounted cash flow model. How is the discounted cash flow model usually taught in universities? And how does that compare or contrast with the discounted cash flow model you like to use yourself? Well, wow, that is a really good question, actually. Uh, so in the university, they'll, they, they'll teach you different types of discounted cash flow models you can use and what kind of inputs to go into. So there's WAC, and not to throw jargon at everyone, but that's just the weighted average cost of capital. Then there's the RR, required rate of return. Then there's the dividend discount cash flow model. Then there's uh, a couple others where, where you use the perpetual approach. Uh, but for the most part, it's a little different uh, in summary. It's a little different from what you will use in the real world because a lot of it has to do with you, you're kind of understanding all of them as to like uh, as a theory. And then when you get into the real world, you have to kind of adapt yourself to what the business world is like, right? But it gives you a general understanding of how to discount cash flows, right? So you learn, mm -hmm. you know, your basic PV functions, uh, future value functions. You, you can use the little calculator, stuff like that. But for the most part, yeah, university just, just gives you that basic understanding. If you want to su succeed in the industry, you got to go further mm -hmm. than what they give you. Okay, cool. So Fabio, let's show our audience now the discount cash flow model that we like to use personally here at Capital Mindset. Yep. So here we go. So what we have pre-filled in here is uh, actually Microsoft. So we have, we put that in there. And just to play around with this, it is not a REIT, uh, <laughs> just in case anyone didn't know that. Austin, I want you to pick and we're going to stay with the standard 10-year discounted cash flow model. Right? Mm -hmm. We could change the years, but we're going to keep it at 10. Austin, I want you to pick the uh, required rate of return. All right. Let's say that I'm an average investor and I would like 10% for my required rate of return. So we're going to have a discount rate of about 10%. And then uh, based on your basic understanding of Microsoft, I want you to provide to me a range in which you think Microsoft will perform going over these 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the growth is predicated on cash flows, correct? Yes, correct. The, okay. gro the, the growth is predicated on the owner's earnings. Ah, 
Okay, perfect. So let's, for scenario one, let's go with 5% growth. Okay. Uh, scenario two is 2%. Scenario three is negative 2%. Uh, scenario four is 7%. And then scenario five is 10%. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we have here basically saying that at a required rate of return of 10%, none of these growth rates would suffice. And mm -hmm. by the way, just so our audience knows, Microsoft has been growing faster than what Austin has mentioned. So Austin's being pretty conservative with the growth rates. I'm and always can, conservative with yeah. my growth rates. <laughs> we can kind of see here the, the different buy prices right here. So this mm -hmm. is what the model is telling us what we, what we would need to buy Microsoft at, at these different growth rates. Mm -hmm. And again, we are actually not calculating any buybacks at the moment. So this right here is telling me the maximum possible buybacks for Microsoft, but Microsoft has been buying back on average about 0.52% of the total market cap uh, each year. So the Microsoft is a huge company. So when you go back and you read like the, the buyback programs they've initiated, it looks like large numbers, but you have to consider in the context of Microsoft's size, they've been doing about that. So you got to think about this as part of their capital return strategy. So we want to consider the uh, buybacks of about 5.2%. Uh, and it's yielding here as a... Um, I was like, whoa. That, that's probably, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, it, we, that was buying back 52% a year. Yeah. Yeah, and, and everything would be a buy. So <laughs> yeah, so what we can see here, uh, even assuming the buybacks, but let's, let's still be conservative. Let's stay on the conservative side. Let's not assume any buybacks, right? Mm -hmm. So... What if we required a 10% rate of return, but we bring it up to speed as to kind of what Microsoft's kind of been growing at, right? 15%, uh, let's do a, let's 20, actually do this, 20. a low of 10%, 15%, okay. 20%, 25%, and then 30%. Perfect. Okay, there you go. Now you start to see what you would have to expect of Microsoft in order for you to achieve a uh, rate of return of around 10% a year for 10 years. Um, and again, this is assuming no buyback. So now let's see, it will change it marginally, but it does change it a little bit. So if you assume the buybacks, there you go. And then you can kind of get and see right here, it's between 20 and 15% growth. That kind of gets it right at 10%. So we can play around with that. We can say maybe 17, uh, 17%. almost, and then we can say instead uh, 18%, yeah, there you go. About between mm -hmm. 17 and 18%, that's where we would want to assume, well, if I assume that it will be there, then I can expect about 10%. But again, when we're saying that, when you want 10%, uh, Austin, are you implying a margin of safety? Um, in that sense, I am not implying a margin of safety. And I know that is one of your favorite ways, yeah. which is why we are about to use the Fabio discount rate here. So my friend, just yes. plug it right in. <laughs> yep. And then, and then explain to our audience why you like to use typically high discount rates such as these ones. So I like to discount heavily because I can always be wrong. And knowing that I can always be wrong, I don't like to uh, put myself in positions where I can easily lose capital, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in this case, uh, a discount rate of 20%, think of it as a 10% discount with a 50% margin of safety. So it seems aggressive, but for me, it, it is appropriate. If I could find a business where I, where even with these conservative measures um, constitute a buy, that's what I'm kind of looking for. Because then I can be wrong, I can be pretty drastically wrong, and I can still come out uh, somewhat on top or maybe just a small loss or, uh, it, it is a tremendous opportunity and I make a ton of money. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm looking for there. And I, I typically like to set up a group of scenarios and then from uh, what I believe to be an aggressive scenario to a conservative scenario. And then if I can see that the conservative scenario works out, then that's one that gets me really excited. And I think we're going to talk about that in a future upcoming video, one that uh, uh, I, I like right now. Mm -hmm. So Fabio, I have a question for some of our viewers here. 
And my question is, there's a lot of misinformation regarding the discounted cash flow models on YouTube. What are some of these misconceptions that others might have about the DCF model? And what might be some potential limitations of using only a DCF model in, dur during your due diligence? Yeah, that's a good question too, because basically a DCF isn't the end all be all. So there are some, I've, I've heard some criticism that it's like, oh, you plug it in in the calculator and spits out a number and that's what, no, no. It, it's both art and science. So, so the, the science part is an asset is the value of the future cash flow, period. And in the short run, there can be fluctuations because fin finance has a lot to do with buying and selling. And in the market, you can deal with emotion. So in the short run, uh, you can have, uh, because mechanically stocks go up when there's more buyers and sellers, and then stocks go down when there's more sellers than buyers. That's the mechanics of how a stock goes up. And, but that it describes the short-term reality. Over the long term, they do reflect the fundamentals and the cash flow because there's no such thing as free money. So if a, if a company is trading, for example, below that what is producing, that's free money. That would never happen. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. If it were to happen, that would be some crazy, crazy, crazy event that would cause that where people are really thinking irrationally and, and they're not really um, uh, able to grasp the idea. But, but in today's world where information is so readily available, you're really not going to see that because that would be an instance of free money. So if a, if a business was uh, returning um, $10 a year and you were able to pick it up for $5, that would be essentially free money. That scenario, I, I doubt you would ever find mm -hmm. in today's world. Maybe in the past when information was hard to come by, but in today's world, no. Now, the, the art part is actually understanding the business and, and projecting what the actual growth will be going into the future. So if you can nail that, then the, then, the, then the DCF actually can help you tremendously in terms of getting an idea of what a business is valued at, right? So it's art and science. And everyone has their own level of discounting that they'll wanna do, their own level of uh, understanding about a business. So that can vary on person to person. And again, that's part of the art, right? And then the art is how conservative do you wanna be or how aggressive do you wanna be and maybe you were right to be conservative or maybe you were okay to be aggressive, you know? So that's, that's the uh, art that mixes with the science. So it's not just a, oh, simple, easy to do. Not like that. Mm -hmm. And I was actually about to ask that as my final question here today, what are some strategies that the prudent investor can employ in tandem with a DCF model? What are some other things, as you so eloquently put, that art? that the investor can mold together with a, uh, a DCF model? Yeah, so with a DCF model, you want to look at the bigger picture of the business. It's again, it's about mm -hmm. understanding the business. So you might want to take a look at management. Was management good? Uh, you want to look at the, what are they selling? Maybe you have some, some knowledge about what they're selling, like some, some deep knowledge. Maybe you, you work in that kind of industry. And then you can kind of on a higher level understand, well, where are they going? forward? Uh, is that industry growing? So these little tidbits that you can add in here and there can help you tremendously. And also a basic understanding of accounting, uh, the better, the more, the better, but a basic understanding of accounting goes a long way because the financial statements can, as you know, can tell mm -hmm. you a story, right? Yes. Especially in, yeah, in your background, you definitely can appreciate that. They, they tell you a story about the business and that story can give you some nuances that they're not going to tell you in their investor presentations, because you have to be very uh, aware that the investor presentations you see by the company, they are sales pitches. They're trying to sell you the business. And you also wanna be aware of the tone, right? If, if, I'm, if I'm a CEO and I sound like a salesman, you should be kind of scared. You, you don't want a CEO to be a salesman. A CEO should actually not care whether or not you wanna buy the stock because they are, they are for themselves uh, set up to benefit if the stock price goes up and they know that the stock price will go up regardless or not you buy. Remember the mechanics, the mechanics of a stock going up is more people are buying than selling. So if the business is really good, the CEO doesn't really care or the management won't really care whether or not you buy it because the business itself will perform in a way that the uh, price of the, of the company will over the long term reflect those fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So you want to also take a look at that. So that's a little bit of um, tidbits here and there of what you want to look for in conjunction with a discounted cash flow. 
So if I'm understanding what you're saying, Fabio, investing isn't just pigeonholing yourself into one um, perspective or one potential avenue. Investing is what you like to call a multi-layered cake where you have to yeah. take components yeah. from yeah. the left and the right and you have to combine them together to kind of create this science, but also at the same time, sort of this art. Okay, that yes. makes perfect sense. Yep, exactly. And awesome. go going into the future, we're going to be doing some... Uh, DCF analysis on a couple stocks. So we have a video coming out soon. If you guys have any ideas for stocks that you'd like us to look into and plug it into the model and see what comes out and can give our opinions whether or not we would be buying it uh, because we will always disclose our portfolio, our positions. If we talk about a stock, whether or not we own it for full disclosure, full transparency, no paywall, no paywall to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, so just leave it down in the comments below. Make sure to go visit our website. Uh, at capitalmindset.org. We have a bunch of free resources there. We're gonna be posting a DCF article with more in depth uh, um, discussion points about what a discounted cash flow can do for you and ways that uh, how to use a DCF and stuff like that. All for free again, no paywall. And as well as different stock analysis articles on there as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And just for full disclosure, we are not registered financial advisors. This is not financial advice and should be used only for entertainment purposes. Uh, I'm your host, Austin, with my co-host, Fabio. This is the Capital Mindset Show, and we look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.